In this video, we're going to take a look at the vCenter security model. Typically, we're going to be using Active Directory users or local Windows users from the vCenter. Although now with vSphere 5.1, we have a new single sign-on service. So if you're using the vCenter appliance on Linux and you're integrating with security providers other than Active Directory, you do have more options. But we'll focus on that type of model for now. So I'm already connected to my virtual center and I'm on the home page. You'll see that there's an option here called roles. And if we click over to roles, there's already a number of roles defined in the system that provide a predefined collection of permissions that are commonly used together. And then we can go and assign those roles at different levels within virtual center to provide people with some or all of the permissions available on particular objects within a certain scope. So we can see that of the roles that exist already, we have one called no access, which we don't really need to use because if I don't grant anyone access, they're not going to get it anyway. We also have read only, where people can connect to virtual center and look around but can't do anything. Administrators who can do whatever they need to. Virtual machine power users. And you'll see over here, we're not currently using this role. No one's assigned to it. But if we right click on it and edit the role, we can see the various permissions that are associated with it. Now, what we probably want to do rather than modifying these existing roles is go ahead and click clone role, make a copy of it, and then just customize what we need. And if I right click and edit that role, then we'll see that it brought over the existing permissions that were associated with the role I'd clicked on the first time. But we can see that on data store objects, we'll have the ability to browse them. The global object level, we can cancel tasks that we had started. We'll also be able to manage scheduled tasks. And at the virtual machine level, we'll be able to do some level of configuration. We can see that we can do things like add disks and change the CPUs, but we're not able to associate it with a host USB device. Not necessarily a major issue, but if we wanted to be copying files back and forth off of USB drives or something, we might need to do that. And whatever other permissions are available in that role, we can see that we can interact with that machine in various ways. We can use the console for it. We can access floppy and CD media. And we can power it off and power it on as necessary. We can't do certain things like set up fault tolerance and potentially other things, but we can customize these roles as we need to. And that's really what each one of these roles is, is just a collection of permissions associated with certain types of objects. So if I want to create an entire new role from scratch, that may be a little tricky because they're really going to need some level of permissions on some of these other objects. And you'll see if you take a look at the various roles that exist already that some of the permissions they have are not necessarily obvious or intuitive. So I would definitely start with one of the roles that exists already and then just clone them and modify them as you need to. So if we've identified one of the roles that already exists as being appropriate to what we want to do, or we've created a new role, then what we're going to need to do is actually assign it. So as we can see, if I right click onto one of these roles, let's take a look at my custom power user role and click add. Well, it's giving us the option to add permissions to it, but that's really what we get if we right click and we do edit role. Really just about the same dialogue, it's just that add allows us to add new permissions. Edit role shows us all the permissions that already exist on it. But this doesn't give me an option anywhere to actually assign this to users or to any objects. So let's go take a look at how we do that. So if I go back to the home page of vCenter and click over to hosts and clusters, we can see that I've got my root object for vCenter. I've got a data center object, two hosts and two resource pools, one on each host, and I've got some virtual machines. And if you take a look through all of these different objects, we can see that they have permission tabs. So if I go all the way to the root of vCenter and click on its permissions tab, we can see that the administrators or potentially a user has the administrator role. It has all the permissions on all the objects. And because we're now assigning that role to the group administrators, the local Windows group administrators, anyone who has local administrator permissions in Windows is going to have administrator permissions on everything managed by this vCenter. Now it's quite interesting how this happens because if you go to one of the hosts, we'll see that we actually do have the ability to set up local users and groups on those hosts, at least when they're not managed by vCenter. And we can also set the authentication services and specify whether we wanted local authentication or set up Active Directory. So there are some options to do authentication locally, but that's really when we're using the vSphere client to connect directly with the hosts.
when we're using vCenter, the vCenter proxy account is what's going to be used to perform all the work on the hosts. And the only permission that we need and the only user assignments that we need are in vCenter itself. So if I go ahead and actually modify this, I'm going to right click on my root object and click add permission. And then I can pick a user or group and we'll see that I can pick the local server or also the VMware single sign-on service or our Active Directory domain. So I'm going to take my Active Directory domain and then try and find a group that might be appropriate for this. Let's go with the network configuration operators. So anyone who's in the network configuration operators group in Windows, and I probably would go create some custom group just for this purpose or for a collection of virtual machines or for a particular data center or a particular resource pool or whatever it is that we're trying to scope to and trying to control. In this case, I'll just use a group that already exists. So if this Windows group has anyone in it, then I'm going to grant them the custom power user role. In this case, at the root of vCenter, so effectively on every object. At least every object where inheritance hasn't been turned off. And you'll notice down here I have a property called propagate to child objects, which specifies whether this should be an inherited permission or not. And usually we do want to do that. But you have to be careful because the VMware permissions model doesn't necessarily work the same way that the Windows permission model does. And this is something that you may need to be aware of. Even though we typically use the Windows authentication services for VMware, there are certainly differences. For example, by default, the administrators group has administrator rights on all of vCenter. What would happen if I went to my data center object or a virtual machine object? and assign different permissions for that same group. We can see here that administrators have the administrator role and our network configuration operators have the custom power user role. And we can actually see that that's been inherited from the VC02 object. But if I wanted to, I could add a permission here. And if I was to do something like add administrators or let's say administrator who is one of those administrators already and gave them the read only permissions, I actually would cause myself problems. So you have to be careful. Locally defined permissions will override inherited permissions. Another area you want to be aware of, and another difference from how Windows manages its permissions, is that when a user in Windows is both a user and has permissions assigned directly to their identity and is also a member of a group and they have permissions that they get through their group membership or multiple group memberships, those Windows permissions will be cumulative. In VMware, that's going to be handled differently. If we have only group memberships, so groups have been assigned these various roles and we have the users in the groups, then it is cumulative. And if the user is a member of one group that has read only and a member of another group that has the ability to access the console of virtual machines and a member of another group that has the ability to manage data stores, they'll be able to do all of those things. However, if the user themselves has been directly assigned any permissions at a specific object level and is also a member of other groups, the group permissions will not apply and only the most specific permissions, in this case the user permissions, will apply. So it's really a best practice to use groups either in Active Directory, which is definitely the way you should do it and that's what Active Directory is for, or local groups on the vCenter server. And then if you're getting into more exotic security models, you can take a deeper look at the single sign-on service and other ways potentially of doing federated identity management with some of the other services and so on. Another thing to be aware of is that, again, we could go and start assigning permissions at each of the different levels, but it's going to be much harder to document and track those permissions. So if we start assigning permissions right at the individual virtual machine level, Yes, we can do that, but it's going to become that much more difficult to remember what exactly is going to take effect at any given time. And we don't really have much in the way of reporting and troubleshooting tools the way Active Directory and even things like Explorer file browsers have now in Windows. We don't really have that inside vCenter. So it's going to be a good idea to try and keep our permissions model as simple as possible, but inheritance will only take us so far. So if we go to the root object and start assigning permissions, that's great. But we could also do that at other levels, such as the data center, or even just using folders or resource pools, or at the host level or the virtual machine levels directly. We shouldn't normally need to do that, but you have the ability to assign permissions directly where you need them. And if someone does need access to the console of one of the virtual machines, the one question I would ask is whether you really want to do that from VMware.
If your local guest operating system already has a remote access capability, Windows Remote Desktop or Linux with SSH or X Windows or you know some other remote control application, we may find that it's easier to manage that type of capability from the perspective of the guests and use the permissions and protocols that already exist within the guests and not have to assign any permissions here at all and never have anyone know that it's a virtual machine. That can be a little tricky because if they do something like shut down, then they may not be able to come back and turn the virtual machine back on. But maybe we want to remove their capability to shut down virtual machines and just let them access the console for whatever it is they're supposed to access it for. So we can definitely take advantage of the roles that are in vCenter. And then we really don't even need to worry about the local security of the hosts. So don't worry about managing Linux-based user accounts inside the hosts. That's what the vCenter proxy account is for. And whenever we set up vCenter to manage hosts, it's going to use root to install its own personal user account, its own personal services, in order to make sure that that can happen. So we don't need to worry too much about security of the local hosts and maintaining passwords and single sign-on and anything like that. That's one of the core capabilities anyway that vCenter provides us.